All attempts in our world to change the rules so that people of God face a choice. Compromise or face the consequences. So from the age of 17 to 19, almost my 20th birthday, I lived with my nana and pop in Bing Lee. And, and that was interesting, being, being a young man like that, a very young, handsome man, living, living with like my grandparents in their 80s, like talk about a generational gap of misunderstandings. Like my grandfather considered... Elvis Presley in the 90s knew corrupt music. And I'm like, dude, he was big in the 50s. Like, are you a 200 years old or something? But one day, I was sitting in the back room watching TV, um, and my, my nana comes in, and my nana loves cricket. She was obsessed with cricket. <clears throat> and she came in and went, Nikki, 
Oh, she called me Nikki No. Nikki No. Nikki No. We're in, we're in a lot of trouble. And I'm like, oh, what are we? And she said, yeah, our cricket team, is, our batters have completely collapsed. And now there was an Ashes. I think it was 1999 when England came over for the Ashes series. <coughs> and Nana's like, we, you got to pray for the Australian cricket team. We're doing terrible. And I said the words I regretted really quickly. I said, well, Nana, what if God wants England to win? Now, before I tell you her, her answer, you need to, um, I'll just put some clarity into it. She was from a generation that um, she, her family had like the largest station in the Northern Territory. They also had land in Rockhampton. So she was all through the outback and, and all her childhood and young life, she heard about how to England we as Aussies were nothing more than colonials. So in the Second World War, the First World War and the Second World War, we were known as the disposables. So Nana had grown up in an era where England just slaughtered our soldiers with, with no mercy, with no regard for human life because we're just disposables. We're colonials, we're not educated. Just get rid of us, it doesn't matter. She also has Irish ancestry, so she knows very well the hor horrendous things that England have done to Ireland over centuries. So with all of that context that I knew nothing about, Nana just said, God never wants England to win. <laughs> and he obviously didn't because we won the series 5-0, so maybe God doesn't want England to win because they invent the sports, but then they never win them. So, <coughs> so, <coughs> so I learned a little bit about our history there. And, and it's very similar to t this morning's passage. We have Jonah here. And Jonah, as we're going to unpack, doesn't want Nineveh to be saved. He doesn't believe they're worth saving. And the context around that is Jonah is from the northern kingdom of Israel in, back when Israel had the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. And Jonah lived in the very north. And the very north were always vulnerable to attacks from Assyria and other people. So when you put it into context, well, you know, why would Jonah want the Ninevites to be saved by God if it just means that they're, they're holier people with holier cows that we're about to learn, and then they can just come and invade anyway. Jonah would rather them gone ski. You know, why can't you just, come on, God. Like, what's going on up there? Wake up to yourself. We need to get rid of them. But God has a different purpose. <coughs> so the book of Jonah is the story of a rebellious prophet who hates God for loving his enemies. And that's something that we're going to wrestle with this morning. The book of Jonah is unique amongst the minor prophets because where the minor prophets have a message to give, in the book of Jonah, Jonah's story is the message. So rather than Jonah coming out and saying, yada, 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 repent, repent, we, we get to learn a message through his journey, through his story. Now, Jonah also appears outside of the book of Jonah in 2 Kings, verse 14, 25. If you blink, you miss it. But here we have King Jeroboam II, who's a bad, bad king, bad, bad king. And Jonah comes up and says, oh, God's going to bless you. You're going to overcome your enemies and, and your borders are going to extend. But then when you read in the context, here comes Amos saying, you're a bad king, God's going to wipe you. So we already should be a little bit suspicious of Jonah's character at this point because he's this one of those king uh, prophets that is just saying what the kings want to hear rather than the tough message. 
Now, the book of Jonah, we're going to skim through the four chapters. The book of Jonah can be divided, there's four chapters, chapters one and chapters three, and this is the interesting part about this book. Uh, One and three is Jonah interacting with non-Israelites. So in chapter one, Jonah is interacting with the pagan sailors. And in chapter three, Jonah is in the city of Nineveh. But the interesting thing is, in these two chapters, the pagan sailors end up worshipping God. The people of Nineveh turn to God and even their cows turn to God, which gives a whole new context to holy cow because they're repenting cows that now worship God. But Jonah seems to be the bad guy, the guy that that's rebelling against God in these two scenarios. And then we have chapters three and, sorry, chapters two and chapters four where we have Jonah's prayers. In chapter two, Jonah is, is sort of praying forgiveness to God, but as we're going to see, there's sort of not much I'm sorry in the message. It's just, oh, I'll go. And then in chapter four, God, um, Jonah is angry at God. This is why I didn't want to go to Nineveh because I knew you were going to show your mercy on these people. Ah, oh. so it's strap yourselves in, folks. This is a very odd prophet we're about to unpack. So, all right, Nev, you can hold that for me. <coughs> so let's dive in. We have Jonah the sailors, and a giant ship. So God says, Jonah, I want you to go to the people of Nineveh and I want you to get them, give them a message that to repent or you're going to be overturned. And then we don't know why at this point, so I've just fully spoiler killed the story for you, but Jonah just goes the opposite way. Instead of going east to Nineveh, he goes west to Tarshish. And Tarshish is significant in this story because if this is Nineveh over here, this is the great city of Nineveh. There's like thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. It's a city so big it has two walls. So it looks like unbeatable. Well, Jonah's like, well... I know this city at the very other end of the Mediterranean and basically because the world is flat, if you go into the outback, you'd think it's flat. This is the very edge of the world. Ah, Nineveh, all the way over there. I'm over here. I'm as far away as I can possibly go. God will never find me over here in Spain Spanish food is beautiful. Their beaches are awesome. They have great dance raves. Um, <clears throat> all the celebrities want to go to Spain. He's as far away from God as he can get. But he forgets one thing. God is the God of the universe. God created the earth. He's the God of, of everything. He created people. He controls nature. So all of a sudden, (coughs) Jonah is in a boat and like people that are hiding, he's in his boat but he's down below. He doesn't want to be seen. He doesn't want to be interrupted. He doesn't want to talk to the sailors and let them know that he's on the run and he sleeps. And then God sends that almighty alarm clock Crash, bang, wave, seasickness. I felt sick watching that Boys Brigade video with the waves. It's just like, oh, were you guys feeling squirmish just seeing the waves go up and down? (coughs) And then the sailors are like, oh, my goodness, this just ain't any storm. This is the storm. Someone's messed up. Someone's messed up with a God here. And then they draw lots and they do all that and then they talk and and everything and then they wake Jonah up and what have you done to your God? And then he talks all this mumbo-jumbo, this religious mumbo-jumbo. 
And we can call it mumbo jumbo in this scenario because Jonah is a prophet of God, God's man. And he's running away from God, undoing his knowledge that God is the God even of the oceans. You can't hide from God. God is in control. So it's like, yeah, I'm sort of, yeah, this God, he created the heavens and the earth. He's, he's, he's in control of even the oceans, but I'm running away from him. And then we see a bigger character flaw because Jonah is then like, throw me overboard. Hey, I'm running away from God. I need to not be near God because I don't want to save that city I hate. So can you guys commit murder? Can you commit murder to help me out? And they're like, oh, no. So they're rowing like, oh, no, 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 we don't want to anger this God as well. If he's already annoyed him and then we kill a holy guy, oh, man, like we're all going under here. So they're rowing and rowing and Jay, not Jabin, Jonah is like, throw me over. Throw me over. So they do. Jonah by running away and not doing what God wants, not committing obedience to God, has now turned the sailors into murderers. But God is already in control anyway because they all turn to God. Jonah goes to the deeps, to the depths of the ocean, like like his own personal sort of hell for three days, while the sailors start worshipping God. Are you seeing the pattern of God's sovereignty here? <clears throat> and now he's off board. I can't jump in these jeans. I'm going to have to go down like an old man. And now he's in the belly of a whale. And then if towards the end of chapter, it's this one, chapter, uh, sorry, in chapter two, we see Jonah's prayer. In my distress, I called the Lord and he answered me from deep in the realm of of the dead I called for help and you listened to my cry you hurled me into the depths into the very heart of the seas and the waves and he keeps praying like this but you don't read I'm sorry Lord I did the wrong thing Lord it's not really like a, a psalm of David is it but God gets it God gets the message and I think because he didn't say sorry, he didn't get to spray out of the sprout at the top, he got vomited out. (laughs) And then I can picture Jonah on the beach going as well. Like, it's messy. Let's not glamorise this part. He didn't get to shoot like an acrobat or a circus delay like out the sprout. It was like, bleh, with fish guts and bones and probably other sailors. <clears throat> and then Jonah's like, all right, Lord, I get it. And let's just pause here. Let's pause here because this is why integrity is so important, isn't it? He, he is God's man and because he's not in obedience to God, because he's not, he's not even trying, is he? Like there's a difference. Like many of us want to obey God. We want to follow God's te- uh, Jesus' teachings and we do our best. And I truly believe God blesses that when we are trying our best in, in our daily lives. But here we have Jonah not even trying, and can you, can you see the hurricane that it creates with the sailors, <coughs> with, him, with himself, by deliberately running away, by not having integrity because he knows the scriptures, he knows God, this hurricane of chaos just keeps following him everywhere. But then we see God fixing things from the distance as well. And right now in our country, all the statistics say that with the younger generations, Aussies are the most 
interested in talking about spiritual and godly things than ever before. Ever before. <clears throat> this whole the world's against us thing and atheists, that's not the case right now in our country. Maybe other countries, I don't know for them, but right here in our country, people are open to talk about these things. But the barrier, the barrier for 78% of Aussies surveyed is hypocritical Christians. Hypocritical Christians. And we can knock a bit off that because a lot of that could be just um, assuming. But, but we have to be very careful, don't we? We have to be careful that we are at least trying to live a good godly life and not holding expectations on other people and creating barriers for other people if we can't even do it ourselves. So here we have Jonah not wanting a city of, if you count women and children, maybe 500,000 people, doesn't want them to have God, but he's not following God either. Can you see the hypocritical pattern happening here? <clears throat> but let's swing back now. God gives Jonah a second chance. And this is, if you're reading this for the first time, it's like those really cool movies where someone tries, they fail, they get angry, their life falls apart, and then that inspirational person says, you can do it, you can do it. And he's like, I can do it. And second chance, Pete comes out, push, 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 and wins the day. That's not the story here, but it's uh, 10%. So now Jonah is spewed out of the belly of the whale. If he just said sorry, he could have sprouted out the top. And he goes, all right, I'm traveling. But we can assume he's not going to go to the ocean. He's probably going to walk it by land. Oh, I'm not testing, my, testing God on the, on the, in a boat again. I'm not going to spend another three days in the belly. <coughs> And he goes to Nineveh. And, and Nineveh will take at least three days to walk through. So Jonah gets to Nineveh, to the people that he hates. He goes in, he walks for a day. So he's not even halfway through the city. He walks for about a day. And then let's listen to his words. <coughs> Remember, these are the words of an inspirational man of God that has been given a second chance that nearly died and nearly came out another end of the whale that we're not even going to go into, but he was saved. So this is the words of a man that got a second chance from God to save a city of nearly half a million people. He gets into the market square 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Thank you very much for listening, people, and walks off. That's it. His second chance of being spewed out of a whale, going in, God's man. Where's the talk of God? Where's the talk of repentance? Where's the talk of Who's going to overthrow you or how it's going to happen or why it's going to happen? <clears throat> Where are the Rick Warren 12 steps to you don't want to be overthrown, so follow these steps and wear Hawaiian shirts like me and you're going to be saved? Nothing. And we're led to assume, and we should never assume, but we're led to believe in this story that Jonah still deep down didn't want Nineveh to be saved but he's like, God, I've ticked the box. I went into the city. I ate the food. I drank the wine. I gave a message and I left. The traveling show is over. But you know what? Because of God's sovereignty, he's like, boom, everyone repents. And just to mock Jonah, even the cows become holy godly cows the cows even repent <clears throat> God's like it's going to happen anyway Jonah it's going to happen anyway and isn't it interesting that we feel 
that, that God's whole plan often rests on us. <coughs> we often feel like, oh, but if I serve God and stuff up, God's whole divine plan is going to be messed up. But take heart for anyone that feels that way because if you even hear, God, Jonah didn't even try and God's sovereignty is all over it. But also, don't be afraid to step out and try for God because we often think, and I've had this many times where I sit and go, God, I've just messed this up so bad. Just wipe me. Don't use me anymore. I'm not worth the hassle. You know, God gives second chances. God gives third chances. To anyone who repents back and says, Lord, I'm sorry, help me here. I love you, help me here. He's going to bring you back in the game over and over and over again. God's not an angry God. Well, God's not a rugby league coach. In a rugby league coach, when I'm coaching and someone drops the ball, it's get him off, get him off. Get him off now. Why is he still on the field? Come on, get him off. He's going to drop it again. Oh, he did. He dropped it again. That's not God. That's not God. God's not an angry coach. God's not an abusive parent. God is love. God is light. And if you want reassurance of God's true character, read 1 John tonight. Read 1 John. It's only short. It's not like 40 chapters of 60 chapters for those doing Old Testament prophets. It's a beautiful, beautiful letter of God's grace, God's light, God's love. And Jonah couldn't get that. Jonah was born too early to read one, John. He didn't get to read it. He didn't get the memo. And Jonah just didn't care. Let's move on to the next bit. <clears throat> so then we're into chapter four, God's mercy. And here we have a, like a bit of an argument, a bit of a dispute, because Jonah says his words. It's eight words in English. It's five words in Hebrew, the shortest sermon ever. I'm for shorter sermons, but that's ridiculous. That's too short. That's too short. That's not even a TikTok video. So, so Nineveh repents, praise God, and the whole city, including the cows, have this big reformation type thing happening, this big revival. They start changing their, their laws. They start wanting to to honour God and see God threaten to overthrow them, overturn, but in essence they were overturned, weren't they? Because they changed from their evil ways. They overturned their society. They overturned their lives. And then Jonah, Jonah's like, but Jonah, this is chapter 4, but to Jonah this seemed very wrong and he became very angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? Can you see the bitterness in that? This is what I tried to foretell, forestall, sorry, by fleeing. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. Joan is throwing God's words against him here from Exodus, and God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life. Well, you just showed all this stuff you showed to us Israelites. You've shown it to our enemies. I can't bear it anymore. Take me, take me away. Very dramatic, isn't it? And then God starts saying, is it right for you to be angry? Like, is it, Jonah, is it right for you to feel this way that, yes, you know I'm gracious, yes, I don't want to send calamity, and I've saved these people? Is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah's like, yes. He's, he's not turning here. 
And then he sends a plant for shade and Jonah enjoys the shade. And then God sends a little grub and then Jonah has no shade and then Jonah starts getting all dramatic again. Take me away, I can't bear this. And then God is, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And how much more valuable are human lives than a plant? How much more valuable are human lives than a plant? So in this story, that was it in in like a a quick autobahn cruise down the highway. But I think you get the point here. We have an angry prophet that doesn't want his enemies to be saved, so he goes to the very end of the flat earth of that time, only to be to cause all this calamity with pagan sailors, drop to the ocean, spend three days in a personal hell, be spewed out, go back to a half-hearted job, only to see God do his thing anyway. And the first real point for this message is the sovereignty of God. We can either hold back to prevent God doing things or sometimes we hold on too tight so that God does do things. It's important for us to allow the spirit to move. So with all our youth ministries, I'm organised a little bit, but to the calamity of my leaders, I leave a lot of openness because I want Jesus to be a part of the team as well. We have mentors now with our leaders for our young adults and a lot of the mentors are like, well, Nick, what's the structure? What's the program? And I'm like, there is none. Let the Holy Spirit lead you with this person because we could write a program, we could buy a program, but every one of our young adults has a different background, a different personality, a different learning style, different views on things and we need the Holy Spirit to work within them the sovereignty of God understand God and the more we learn about God the more we can relate to God the more we can see God work even with the people we don't like the uh, I must be because I was pondering on this message all week I had a dream <clears throat> and it was a very disturbing dream, someone that I, I don't hate, okay, I'm not going to say I hate, I've worked with God with this, but someone I like less than other people. And this person that I like less than other people became a millionaire. I don't know if it was lotto, inheritance, or, I, you know, my dream wasn't very specific, but they became a millionaire and I chucked a tantrum. Oh, well, this is great. Oh, everything works out for him. What about me, Lord? I'm the one that has to fundraise for my own wages at SU. I'm the one that has to do all this and put up with that. And oh, I'm on Struggle Street, Lord, but this guy gets millions of dollars. Oh, look at him in his jag. Oh, I wish I had a jag. And then I woke up and went, oh, my goodness, I'm Jonah. I'm Jonah. See how easy it can be? See, we're all sitting here going, oh, Jonah. But see how easy, even in a dream, that's not, please know that's not reality. That was a dream that I had to really sort myself out over. But we have to be careful too, don't we? The second point is God gives us second chances. And that's really important for us not just to hear and go, oh, that's cool, but believe in here. Believe in here and don't be scared if you completely stuff up everything and get a second chance because when you get the second chance, that's when you feel God's grace. I mean, really feel it, really know it. In my early 20s, my mentor, my, the, pers- the man that, w- that discipled me for so long, he discipled me and he was so good at it. By the time I was about 26 years old, I could actually do every role in a church. 
Yes, he taught me the scriptures. Yes, he taught me about worship. He taught me about, evan- I was a raving evangelist. Me in my 20s, Gerald and the, the Restore crew, they would have loved me at the courthouse. I didn't take anything seriously. I, I didn't get into arguments. I was so well trained with it. And I was putting my heart and soul into loving God, evangelizing Jesus, and I could do every role in a church. Some better than others, but I knew the basics. But then this church became filled with disgruntled Christians from other churches that joined our church and had baggage from their previous churches And as a young man in his mid-20s, I watched my pastor, my closest friend, my mentor, my discipler, just be crucified by these conservative Christians that were using religion to slay him because of their past hurts from other churches. And as a young man, I saw this, and when the whole thing folded, I was the last man standing with my mentor. And I remember going home and praying because I was just about to go to Malian College and I said, Lord, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And I ran. I ran from that calling and I never, I didn't look back and I ran. And when I look back over those probably 12 years, I was doing every role as close to what a pastor would be in a secular world. And I can also see, just like Jonah, that God never forsook me, never abandoned me, never wiped me. And I ran, but the problem is, when you run, you can run too far. And then when you run too far, you get lost. And when you get lost, you lose all your good Christian accountability, and all of a sudden, you're in a desert. And it's scary and you start to think God has forsaken you even though he's still there with you. And around COVID was the first time that I actually stopped since I became a Christian in my early 20s. And I was still going to school as a chaplain, but all my volunteer work, all my extra stuff got shut down because of COVID. And for the first time I sat and I felt God call me. Not to any ministry, not to anything, but, hey, I'm still here, Nick. It's time to sort you out. And God started to sort me out. And it was in that moment, now in my probably, I would have been maybe 40, 39, I was 39, I could read Amazing Grace and I knew it. It wasn't just some song I sang I actually felt, yes, and then I started to know Jesus more. I didn't just know about him. I didn't read about him. I didn't evangelize him. I knew Jesus because I was completely lost, and God restored me and said, I'm not finished with you. So I want to urge anyone here, if you are running from God right now, today's the day you say, all right, God, I'm not running anymore. Come to me. Now, it might not be running away like me, but are you running away from a calling? Are you running away from patching up a relationship where there's, there's fracture? Are you running away from accepting something about God? Are you angry at someone and you don't want them to know Jesus? It could be anything. We run for any reason, don't we? Life is complicated. But if you are running, today's the day you say, all right, Lord, I'm going to put this to bed with you. It could be a hurt from the past. It could be anything. It could be forgiving your spouse. You could be in a really tough time right now in your marriage or in your family, and it's like, all right, Lord, I've I've been angry at him. I've researched poison recipes. I've, I've set up traps in the house. But Lord, I realize that's not the answer. I need your help, Lord. 
I'm coming back to you now. I've tried all my ways. I want your way now. Your way, Lord. (coughs) And the very last one, God's mercy is for everyone. Everyone. Even the person that destroyed your business. Even the person that that stole your partner. For anything. God's mercy is for everyone because there was a point for all of us before we confessed Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, we were an enemy of God and we're only the person we are now because of grace, because of forgiveness. But God's mercy is for everyone. God's salvation when God died on the cross, it wasn't just for the white middle class people. Or it wasn't just for the Jews. It was for everyone. And think of how messy our world is right now. How divided our world is right now. For all the different groups of people you might be upset about or you might watch on the news and go, ah, if that happens, stop watching Fox News. But but God... Mercy is for all of them. And if we are in a divided class, how can we share the gospel to them? It's time for us to stop disliking all the different groups in our world, to stop being like Jonah. So if you have the spirit of Jonah, there's a class of people that you think they are your Nineveh. And I'm just throwing things up there, but it could be the the far lefties. It could be um, a certain race of people. It could be the LGB, all those letters. But God's mercy is for them as much as it is for us and your children and your family. God loves all of these people. He desires all of them to come to him through Jesus Christ, the one and only Lord. And, and I'm tired of pastors and preachers saying the, the spirit of Jezebel because really her husband was actually the king and he should have sorted all that out. But what about the spirit of Jonah where we think certain classes of people are below us, that certain groups of people don't deserve God's grace, love and forgiveness. We need to sort out the spirit of Jonah in our families, in our Christian movement. So the book of Jonah holds a mirror to the one who reads it. In Jonah, we see the worst parts of our own character. And God is saying, is that right? Is it right for you to be angry? So let's just take a minute now Let's just take a minute and just, for those that are running, let's turn back to God. For those who may have a spirit of Jonah within them, it's time to say, Lord, I give it to you. I nail it to the cross. Nail these prejudices to the cross and say, Lord, I want to be your right person. I want to be full of love, compassion, and grace. While the music team come up, Let's just have a quiet moment with the Lord. Thank you. 